Well, good evening and welcome to everyone watching on Facebook, YouTube, and those of you watching on GoToMeeting. Uh, this is episode 84 of Warbird 2, and on tonight's episode, we'll travel back more than 80 years to a very pivotal point in history, September of 1939. But before we get started, could you do us a favor? If you haven't already done so, please take a second to like or share and hit that subscribe button and follow us. If you do subscribe on YouTube, also click the bell icon to make sure you get notifications about all of our new episodes of Warbird 2. Now, as you're watching tonight, you might have some questions. Just type them in the comment section of whatever media platform you're on, and we'll try to answer them either during the presentation or before we sign off. Joining me now is the director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, Chris Kolakowski. Chris, welcome back to Warbird Tube. Glad to have you here again. Thank you very much, Steve. It's great to be back. It's great to be working, <coughs> excuse me, working again with the Commemorative Air Force. You guys do great work, and it's always fun um, working with you all. I do have a technical question to make sure that you can see my slides here in full screen. Yes, I can see. Them. Okay, perfect. Um, so thanks for having me tonight. It's, as you mentioned, um, you know, in your promo, and as you mentioned in the introduction, we are just past the 83rd anniversary of the outbreak of World War II in Europe. And for some of you who may have attended when we did last December, as a matter of fact, the Road to War in the Pacific, uh, this is the companion piece. How did how did Germany come to be invading Poland in 1939? What did that? What was the process that led to that point? There was a lot that went into that. And so in the time that we have tonight, I'm going to spend some time exploring that process and then uh, to probably talk for about 45 minutes or so and cover a lot of ground. I've got 25 years of history I'm trying to consolidate into 45 minutes, so we're going to go kind of quickly. But if anybody has any questions, I know with a group like this, there's going to be some great questions at the end. Um, so that's that's the agenda for this evening. Um, and so the first, really, we're going to answer the question is, well, how did World War II in Europe come? And to start with World War II in Europe, or to start with 1939, we actually have to rewind the clock, as I mentioned, 25 years to 1914. This is Europe in 1914 when the First World War begins. Now, there's a couple of things that I need to point out to you about this map. I'll orient you quickly to, to the map. Um, here's the United Kingdom, north being at the top. The United Kingdom, I'm circling with my cursor, of course, France directly to its south, and then Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, Italy, the Balkans, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, Greece, Turkey. We know the Ottoman Empire today is Turkey. And then Russia, I'm circling with my cursor, which at the time owned Ukraine. Poland and the Baltics and Finland. And then up here is Norway and Sweden and Scandinavia. In the center, and Belgium and the Netherlands over here, I can't forget the low countries. In the center, you'll notice Germany, German Empire, and then notice this big glob right here, Austria Hungary. This was a multinational, multi ethnic empire ruled from Vienna and had existed for quite a few centuries. This is Europe in 1914. I want you to remember this map because in a few minutes, I'm going to show you a map of post-war uh, World War I. World War I starts, obviously, in August of 1914. The United States enters World War I in April of 1917 and in no October, November, depending on the country, um, ultimately ending with Germany's uh, signing the armistice on November the 11th, 1918, ends World War I. And then they meet in Versailles in Paris to settle the peace and determine the future of Europe after World War I. It has been an incredibly damaging war for every single participant. Russia, which had been, as, had been ruled by the czars at the start of the war, had fallen into a revolution in 1917. Germany had lost significant parts of its population. One third of the British military, popula military age population had been killed in the war. Um, and France, in particular, it was said one, one Frenchman died every seven seconds on the Western Front during World War I. One Frenchman every seven seconds. So France is crippled, not to mention where most of the major battles, particularly of the Western Front, although fighting did occur elsewhere, Italy, the Balkans, Gallipoli Peninsula, and Turkey, and, the, and Palestine being the biggest ones. The vast majority of the fighting and the vast majority of the death on, on the continent of Europe occurred. If it didn't occur in Russia, it occurred in France. And that's where you get very large battles of Verdun, the Somme, Passchendaele, um, bywords for um, just incredible casualties, sometimes for very, very little gain. 
so at the end of World War One, there is this incredible, incredible um, aftershock, but also an incredible desire to never have this happen again. And that produces the Versailles Settlement. It reorders Europe at the end of the war. It organizes and recognizes some of the nations because the borders move immediately after the war. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail in a minute. The big thing about it, though, is, is it asserts as if it's a fact that Germany caused the war. The primary cause for World War I is the actions of the Empire of Germany, which has since fallen and become a republic. And as a result, Germany bears the prime financial burden. They will pay reparations. There's also severe limits on the military because nobody wants Germany to do this again. And so no Air Force anymore. Limit the Navy, very, very strong limits on the Navy, including no submarines. Submarines had, had nearly brought Britain to her knees in 1917. No submarines. And the German army, which had numbered at its peak several million, is limited only to 100,000 personnel and is not allowed to have a lot of heavy equipment, is not allowed to have, is limited in the number of officers, is limited in the number of people they can take in. So there's a very severe limit on what the Germans uh, can do. And it's designed to prevent the Germans from trying again at some point. And then the Allies will occupy part of Germany, the Rhineland on the western part of western part of Germany, just west of the Rhine River. I'll show you that on the map here in a minute until 1923. And then there will be a demilitarization of the Rhineland and also the Ruhr industrial area just over the river um, after that. Again, all of this is designed to punish Germany for what they did or for what it did, but also for uh, to prevent something like this happening again. The Germans, for their part, regard this not as a negotiation because the Germans were not invited until the very end just to be handed the treaty and say, either vote, the, either accept this or we restart the war. And the Germans would in fact accept, be, basically be forced to accept this. And instead of calling it a peace, Frieden, the word they used was diktat or the dictation, the, dict, the, the, the uh, decree of Versailles. So here's Europe in 1919, immediately after the war. Now, one of the things you'll notice about this map, there are several, several major changes that have happened. Um, first of all, you'll notice the French, British borders and the low countries here to the west um, haven't changed much. And right here is the Rhineland, where I'm tracing my cursor right now. That's where the Allied occupation and demilitarization will be. But look at Eastern Europe and look at the Balkans, or excuse me, the Sc look at Scandinavia and the Balkans to a certain extent down here. But look at how this has changed. Finland, which had been a, a ruled by the Tsar of Russia, is now an independent country. Of course, Russia has become the Soviet Union. Here's the USSR. But notice how far back the Russian border has gone because Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have gotten their independence. German province here of East Prussia. Poland has reappeared on the map for the first time since the late 1700s. And then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which I showed you on the 1914 map, has split as many of these ethnic groups assert their independence. The Austrian Empire crumbles in 1918, and you can see all of these here. And then some of the Austrian parts of the Austrian Empire are grouped together with the Serbs to form the Republic here of Yugoslavia. So there's been a lot of movement and there's a lot of nations that haven't been independent for centuries in several cases that are newly independent uh, for me, or newly independent countries. But the other thing is when these borders move, and this is something to keep in mind, these are not always homogenous populations. And I want you to remember that. We're going to talk a little bit more about the implications of that as we go. But this is the big point. Um, if you get a, a, the, one of the key seeds uh, um, that's planted that will eventually lead to war in 1939 and the German aggression in the late 1930s is in reaction to the titanic changes in the geography, particularly of Central and Eastern Europe between 1914 and 1922. Okay, so it's important to note this. This is what this plants the seeds. This is what will set a lot of a lot of other things in motion on the road to war in 1939. So let's go look at the 1920s very, very quickly. What does all this mean? Having set the stage now by 1922, 
having set a new order in Europe, having imposed the peace of Versailles on Germany, what does it mean? The effect of re reparations is an albatross on the German budget and an albatross on the German economy. Um, between that and the depredations of the war, not to mention dislocation and uh, armies coming back, you've got all these soldiers that come back that suddenly don't have jobs. The economic and social dislocation um, actually wrecks the German economy. There, at one point in 1923, the German mark, the uh, the German currency, uh, one dollar for every is every 4.2 million marks. One U.S. dollar for 4.2 million marks. That inflation doesn't last that long, but it it's long enough that it's it's a very serious issue. A loaf of bread in in Munich in 1923 would cost sometimes two million marks. So it's hyper hyper inflation. And the Germans, there's tremendous resentment by what at, at the Versailles diktat, which is what I well, why I emphasized that earlier, that it had been imposed upon them in the way it had happened. The other thing that is trend that is moving, particularly in Europe and particularly in Eastern Europe, and we've touched on a little bit already, there's a lot of nationalist movements that are occurring. These newly independent nations are flexing their muscles. They're feeling very proud of themselves. They're happy to have sovereignty again. Um, and there's this tremendous feeling of national pride. But there are also, as the borders have moved, there are significant ethnic tensions because there are minorities, particularly Germans in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire that are now in, in, living in other countries, or Germans as well from Germany, and we'll talk about them in a little bit, that live in Poland, that live in some other places as well. And it's not just them. It's there's tensions between various ethnic tribes. Yugoslavia um, has issues. We, we're still dealing with those issues today in some ways between Serbia and Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, particularly if you think about the conflicts of the 90s. So you've got all this rise of nationalism that's going on and this assertion of that, that it's a new Europe and there's a lot of opportunity and it, there's a lot of national pride, uh, particularly the way the borders have moved as an after effect of what we talked about. The other thing that starts to happen, particularly in this time of social and political dislocation and disorder after the war, is the rise of fascism, particularly first in Italy with Benito Mussolini taking over in 1922. Even though Italy was on the winning side, Italy had suffered incredibly terrific losses during the war and after the war had emerged actually in a pretty weak position. And that's a that's a, a is an opening for Mussolini to move in with the fascist party and he basically founds fascism and actually will be considered the senior fascist in europe really until about 1941 1940 1941 um, he'll be deferred to as the senior fascist also at this time um, a german serviceman named adolf hitler and the national socialist party will begin to become a political force he'll try and over try a coup in 1923 get thrown in jail for a few years write his manifesto mein kampf and then afterwards, after he and he and his compadres are released, um, the Nazi party will be a force in German politics and the Weimar Republic, as it's known at the time. So in all of this fascism, there's authoritarian forces that are rising up during this period and tapping into some of that nationalist fervor as well in both countries. The British and the French, as far as they're concerned, this is a period of great peace and retrenchment. Both of them are more focused on their empire, and both of them are more focused on disarmament. They will spearhead some arms limitation treaties, particularly the naval one in 1921-22 in Washington, but there will be some others as well um, that will go on, and the idea is to try and disarm, try and, and, and keep war. They don't want to have anything in the future. Now, there are people in all of these militaries, particularly in uh, the continental continental militaries, but also in Britain, that are thinking about even though the First World War was called the war to end all wars, there's pretty good suspicion that there's going to be another conflict at some point. And there are theorists that are looking at what that means, particularly with regard to this new thing, the internal combustion engine and trucks, tanks, and aircraft. And the tanks and trucks are a little bit beyond our scope right now, but I will simply say this is the period where you get people like uh, JFC Fuller, um, Charles de Gaulle and some of the other early experiments, George Patton and Dwight Eisenhower here in the United States, um, experimenting with the possibility of what motorized units could be, mechanized cavalry, and what that could mean for land warfare. Of course, that will transmogrify into 
blitzkrieg that's the seeds of blitzkrieg in 1939 and 1940 the lightning war that's the land theorists from our perspective um, there's also considerable discussion about air um, here in the united states billy mitchell is arguing for an independent air force and arguing for the supremacy of air power how it has made much of the rest of war of, of national power particularly surface fleets and also um, surface armies um, somewhat uh, obsolescent he's not the only one and there are others others arguing in different parts in different countries Hugh Trenchard for example with the Royal Air Force um, was an acolyte as well and was arguing this one of the most important and influential however is an Italian general named Giulio Dupet who in the early 1920s writes a book and he talks about how he, he, he predicts that air power if, if by studying the Zeppelin raids during World War I and studying what the potential of that was and the Paris gun that bombarded Paris from the German lines, he realized that, that one of the ways that, that actually wars could be shortened and probably won very quickly is if fleets of aircraft fly over capital cities and bomb them and set fires and break the national will to resist. And he proposes that any future war will be short because all you have to do is bomb the enemy capital city and key cities in the rubble and the war will end very quickly because the, the country will lose heart and that will be that. He predicts even things as simple as a, less than a thousand planes dropping in one case, if he predicts 18,000 pounds of bombs on London um, could cause 2 million killed and wounded and cause a great panic in London. We know from the experience looking back through World War II that Duhet's theories were not, ended up not being valid, largely. But there's no evidence to that effect in the 1920s and the 1930s. His book catches on in people around Europe, particularly in, in Germany, in France, in Italy, and in Britain to an extent, pay attention and use his book and as far as they're concerned, when they think about what the possibility of war, what the possibility of air war could be, Duhet is what they turn to because it seems so persuasive. And he's writing it just a couple of years after World War I. So it becomes kind of the first voice and therefore the one of the a dominant, if not the dominant voice theory about air power going forward. We're going to explore those effects a little bit more in just a minute. Two other things I want to mention as well to talk about the 20s mentality, talk about the international mentality at this time is the Kellogg Briand Pact, 1927-1928. It's signed by most of the existing nations of the world at the time. And basically what it does is it outlaws aggressive war as an instrument of national policy. But it allows wars in self-defense. And there's no enforcement mechanism. So what it ends up being, it ends up being open to incredible interpretation. But because there's no enforcement mechanism, it really is one of those where it's it's a wish. It ends up being an idealistic wish. But it says something about the state of much of the world that nations will sign it, and that such a such a pact can, would uh, would even be considered. Um, again, getting back to what we talked about about the cost of World War One and the desire of most nations to avoid that ever again, if possible, and in fact, a fear of another modern industrial war in a lot of ways. There's no other way to say it, fear. On top of all this, the Great Depression starts. It starts actually in Europe in 1929 and makes its way across. And one of the last countries actually to fall in the Great Depression is the United States with stock market crash in October of 1929. This stresses governments, it stresses, stresses societies, it stress, stresses economies. Um, if you think about the crash of 2008, if you think about some of the recession issues that we've had uh, just in the last 20, 30 years, you can you, you understand what I'm trying to say. And those weren't as bad as what these happened. As a matter of fact, the United States had 25 percent um, unemployment during uh, the early years of the Great Depression. So that that needs to be kept in mind when you think about the 1930s. Um, so as we pass it from the 20s into the 30s through the Great Depression, and let's look at what's going on in the major countries that are the major players in our story. The United Kingdom has been, since 1922, operating under the 10-year rule, which will last until 1932, and it's the idea that they budget assuming there won't be a major war for 10 years. They abandoned it finally in 1932, but they're still behind 
in a lot of things. However, technologically, in terms of the development of radar, in terms of the development of, of aircraft, for example, the supermarine, supermarine Spitfire, the development of Hurricane, those will start soon after. There's also a major fleet building boom. The King George V class of battleships will start in 1936, 1937. The other thing that needs to be kept in mind is the British government from basically August 1936 until the first few months of 1937 is distracted by the crisis of Edward VIII. Uh, King George V had died in January of 1936. Edward VIII wants to marry an American divorcee. It becomes a huge crisis for the British government and is a distraction, not just dealing with him through abdication in December of 1936, but then also the after effects um, because the British haven't had a king that abdicated, um, I believe, ever in their history up to that time. And so when George VI is crowned in 1937, with his older brother still very much alive, you know, there's some, there's some, that requires some attention to the British government that they could be using elsewhere with what's going on. And we'll talk about that. The French are internally politically divided. They go through a succession of governments. Um, it's lurching right and left. There's a lot of division. A couple of things the French are united on, however, is that having suffered what they have suffered in the First World War, they don't want to go through it again. And what saved France was they look at the Battle of Verdun, and what saved France was defense and fortification and the ability to, to hang on. And um, that's what they decide their doctrine is going to be. It's going to be very defensive. They're basically preparing to fight a, a, an upgraded version of the last war. And one of the things they construct is they construct one of the most elaborate fortification belts um, certainly seen in the last 200 years, the Maginot Line along the common frontier with Germany. And that's the idea is to, to fortify the German frontier and then let the, come, come as it may. Um, and so that's the French approach. But also the political division means that France doesn't necessarily have a coherent diplomacy, a coherent policy um, throughout much of the 1930s just because of the political instability of their governments. The United States is very simple, we're isolations. United States had problems with dealing with the building of the Great Depression, the New Deal, the very isolationist fervor in the, in the, in the country, and uh, that's where the United States is. So the United States is effectively going to be out of this process until it's dragged in um, to, to World War II. Soviet Union is isolated. Uh, most countries don't actually have diplomatic relations with Moscow until the early 1930s at the earliest. The other thing is Joseph Stalin is starting the Great Purges, particularly in 1937, and will continue that all the way into 1941, um, purging. If just just read about the Great Purges, the the uh, emasculation and decapitation of the bureaucracy and the Red Army during this period was just uh, it beggars belief. It beggars belief. But he Stalin's dealing with that. Uh, Joseph Stalin is dealing with that in the Soviet Union. And then, of course, also the Soviet Union still runs the Communist International, which they will until 1943, promoting world revolution, uh, which also contributes to their isolation because dealing with the Soviet Union, a lot of people view, then legitimizes the uh, Communist International. Germany and Italy, on the other hand, are very much on the rise. Um, in Germany, Adolf Hitler becomes chancellor on January 30th, 1933. Um, very quickly, he and the Nazis begin to establish very, very strong control over Germany. In 1934, when Hindenburg dies, the president, Hitler combines both the president and the chancellor of Germany into himself and begins a rearmament program. And in 1935, begins to unveil the first tanks, the first trucks, um, army maneuvers but also begins to unveil the first German Air Force, which had been built somewhat in secret, had been developed. There was, uh, they had used glider, squad, glider schools to teach, teach flyers. They had built what they called mail planes um, that were easily convertible into twin engine fighters or even single engine fighters sometimes. Um, and so that att attracts people's notice in 1935 when he repudiates and stops all reparations payments and repudiates the Peace of Versailles. Um, and the creation of the Luftwaffe, as the German Air Force is called, is catches the world's attention. Some of this we now know was bluff, 
um, Hitler would take the press or, or he would have his people take the press um, around to different airfields and they'd see all these planes. But uh, a lot of times those planes had been flown ahead and they were the same planes, just different markets. The point of this though is, is what is the perception outside of Germany? The perception outside of Germany is that Germany is developing a very strong air force, which by 1939 they will have. But in 1935 and 36, that's not necessarily the case. But remember what I said earlier about the influence of Duhet and these other thinkers. That has that air force make that air force plus Duhet's theories make other countries sit up and take notice about the potentials and begin to make the, even the possibility of what Duhet was predicting in a lot of people's minds, particularly in France and in Britain and in countries neighboring Germany, potentially a reality. And that's something that needs to be kept in mind. Actually, the best summation of what I just said comes from the first chief of staff, the US Air Force, General Tui Spots, who said the German Air Force dominated world diplomacy during the 1930s. And that's important to keep in mind. A lot of times, remember, we know today, with hindsight, we can see, have a fuller picture of what Nazi Germany was on the rise and actually how relatively slow a process it was, particularly with rearmament. It's not the case in the 1930s. And it's important to remember that there was the perception for a lot of countries around Germany was their reality. And Hitler made sure their perception was that Germany was, was a strong, strong nation in the center of Europe and was going to be a threat. And then, of course, repression, repression of political enemies, repression of organizations, and, of course, starting in 1933, repression of the Jews, which will continue to get incredibly. This is the beginning, beginning of the Holocaust, of what will ultimately be the death of six million Jews and the death of another five million on top of that. Um, but you're starting to see that as 1933, the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 going forward. Um, ultimately, of course, Kristallnacht. November 11th, 1938, um, and then of course into World War II, and that well, well known yet extremely tragic story. That's already happening. Italy, for its part, Mussolini, he first made the trains run on time. It's an old joke of his, but it's true. It was also by the 1930s, beginning, mid 1930s, beginning to expand, particularly in Africa, uh, beginning to build empire. Mussolini wants to create. Uh, create the, a new Roman Empire and create a Mediterranean Empire again, which puts him in some conflict with the British, which again is, is an issue, influences British policy. Um, but Mussolini, again, looking as well, viewing Italy as a major player in this new Europe, uh, particularly in, in league and and they'll eventually ally themselves um, with Germany. Um, and so that's what's going on, the general backdrop, if you will, in these countries as we think about the events and as we dive into the events of the 1930s and as we see this play out. It's worth keeping all this in mind. Everything I've talked to you about sets the stage. Now let's set some of these events in motion here in the 1930s. In early 1936, on the 7th of March, 1936, Adolf Hitler takes three battalions and two squadrons of the Luftwaffe and tells them to cross the Rhine River and retake the Rhineland and reassert German control over the Rhineland. It's a part of Germany anyway, it's been demilitarized, occupied. And they have strict orders, if the French move so much as a finger, turn around and go back. The French believe, a French chief of the general staff tells the French government, because they ask him, why don't we move in? We are under treaty obligation. If they move into the Rhineland, we have to go after them. And he says there are 300,000 Germans in the Rhineland now, 300,000 German troops. I'm, do you want to go to a general war against them? And the answer is no. And so the French take no action. The British take no action. And so the Rhineland is reoccupied by Germany. It, one of the great what ifs of the road to war in Europe is what if the French had done something and had had forced Hitler to order his troops back. Might that have short-circuited everything else we're gonna be talking about after that. But this is important to keep in mind. This is the first domino to fall on the road to war. 
few months later, July 17th, 1936, the Spanish Civil War begins. It will last until the 31st of March, 1939, and it will be fought by the nationalists under Francisco Franco, who will basically control initially this area that I'm circling with my cursor, and then the Republic, and they will control the other areas, and ultimately by the end, Franco will control all of Spain. He will win the war. He won't be able to do it <clears throat> without German and Italian help. Both will send contingencies, or excuse me, um, contingents. Uh, the Germans in particular will send an air force. They'll send their early tank units. It actually becomes something of a proving ground for German technology and, and German weapon systems, and to a lesser extent, the Italians. It also becomes something of a proxy war because the Soviets support the, uh, the uh, Spanish Republic, while the Germans and the Italians support Franco. And so it becomes something of a proxy fight between the Soviets and the West in some ways, because the British and the French, to varying degrees, support the Spanish Republic also, and then Franco and his fascist fellow travelers, although it's debatable how fascist Franco truly was. In fact, Franco couldn't have gotten the core of his army from Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar without German air transport in 1936. So this is an important, this goes on in the background of everything else we're going to talk about up through March 31st, 1939, and is in many ways a glimpse of what modern warfare might look like. And I say that to show you this picture. This is Guernica in northern Spain, right after the bombing of the city on the 25th of April, 1937, by German aircraft. It's just a few dozen German aircraft flying five different waves, and they reduced the city to rubble. There are wild estimates of how many dead. We know today they weren't as many as people think, but in the, again, perception, popular mind is people see these photographs, they hear the perception of several thousand killed. In reality, it wasn't that many, although the losses were horrific. I don't want to minimize that at all. But when you see pictures like this and death tolls like that, and then the famous Pablo Picasso painting, which is painted and then immediately put on display at the World's Fair in Paris, which is going on in 1937, this makes a profound impact on people. And for the people who believed that Duhet's theories were valid, they have evidence that says, yes, in fact, it was. That this, Because this did, it struck terror into the defenders of northern Spain, into the Basques, and um, as you can see, rendered great destruction as well. And so, Guernica will be a ghost in the back of the minds of a lot of politicians and a lot of military thinkers over the next few years. Um, and that's one of the reasons, that's a big reason why Guernica has the emotional place in memory of the Spanish Civil War and beyond um, that it does. As a matter of fact, a copy of Picasso's painting sits outside the UN Security Council chamber today. So that should tell you something about the emotional impact and resonance of this vomit. Let's get into 1938. Hitler has spent 1937 supporting Franco, rearming, continuing to build up the German Air Force and the German Army in particular. And now in early 1938, he begins to make arguments that will he will use again and again on the road to war. Uh, first of all, here's, here's Central Europe, here's Germany. The dark green is the Rhineland, which had been reoccupied in 1936. It started by saying, I am just taking territory that is occupied by Germans. In other words, I've taken back a part of Germany that had been separated for a while, had been demilitarized. In early 1938, he revives an old idea, Großdeutschland, Greater Germany, which had been talked about off and on for many, many, many centuries, actually the union between Austria and Germany. It had never quite come together, although there had been German confederations. The Holy Roman Empire covered this area that sort of united Germany and Austria, but Hitler pushes for a unification of the German speak of German speaking Austria with Germany itself. Of course, Hitler was Austrian born and later a naturalized German citizen. So there's an emotional component here for him as well. But again, he's trying to, as he views it, unite the Germans 
unite the German speaking people into one, uh, particularly Austria having lost the empire um, to become part of Germany and then form a strong union. Anschluss is the word that he uses. And he actually strong arms the Austrian government into agreeing to the Anschluss and the Germans roll into Austria on the 12th of March, 1938. And they don't know how they're going to get greeted, actually. It's come back now, even today. And people weren't sure how they were going to get greeted, but the Austrians are deliriously happy to be greeting the Germans. Um, and it's still something today in the national memory of Austria is how just how many Austrians ended up fighting in the German army and being involved in, in the German war effort during the Second World War. The 2nd Panzer Division, by the way, the 2nd Tank Division that the Germans create is in Vienna, it's the 2nd Panzer Division which of course will go on to fame, particularly the Battle of the Bulge, um, among other places. So Austria is absorbed into Germany. Um, as a matter of fact, it, as far as the Germans are concerned, Austria becomes a province of Germany known as Ostmark, and it will have that status until 1945, when it is once again, um, at the end of the war, torn, torn back or returned to an independent nation. A few months after Austria, Hitler turns and looks at Czechoslovakia. And you'll notice where Czechoslovakia is here, particularly centered on Prague. This whole nation, the way it stretches out this way, but it also runs in as a cul-de-sac right into Germany, between Dresden and Vienna, basically. And there's a lot of ethnic Germans in this what's yellow area known as the Sudetenland, They're heavily ethnic German. They're Austrian Germans. They'd settled there during the Austrian Empire. Some of them had moved across the border from Germany, from Saxony, which is that part of Germany uh, where they are. Um, and so, and, but, but it's a heavily ethnic German region. It also happens to be the Czech defenses happen to be right along there. The Czechs have built a fairly strong fortification line. Hitler decides he's going to, emboldened by the fact that there was no strong Western reaction to Austria or to the Rhineland, decides that he's going to try and pressure Czechoslovakia um, and begins to encourage uprisings by the ethnic Germans in the Sudetenland. And as, an, as a desire to protect the Sudetens, as he, pra as he phrases it, as he wants to protect his fellow Germans um, from Czech oppression, he plans an invasion of Czechoslovakia, um, scheduled to go on the 1st of October, 1938. His generals are horrified by this. As a matter of fact, they threatened, they, they, they planned overthrowing. You know who else is threatened, by, is, is, is horrified by this? France and Britain, particularly with the Spanish Civil War still going on. Um, there's a real fear that this could lead directly to a new war in Europe particularly because the Czechs are interested in allying themselves with the French and the British and are asking for help. Ultimately, in a lightning fast uh, summit that is convened at Munich in southern Germany, right here, on the 29th and 30th of August, or the 29th and 30th of September, 1938, the British, the French, the Italians, and the Germans all meet without consulting the Czechs and sign over the Sudetenland to Hitler. Hitler also guarantees that the rest of Czechoslovakia, which shows up there in the pink and the purple, will not be violated. And so at a stroke, first of all, the invasion is canceled, but at a stroke, the Czechs lose their major defense positions, they lose significant parts of their army, but they also lose control of the Skoda Works, which is, along with Krupp in, in uh, the Ruhr, is one of the great arms manufacturers in Central Europe. And it basically cripples Czechoslovakia and sells them down the river. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain goes back, holds up the piece of paper, I believe we have peace in our time, he says. Hitler, on the other hand, as far as he's concerned, has taken the measure of his opponents in Paris and in London and thinks nothing of them and tells his advisors, I'm tired of peace conferences, I shan't have another one. And he regards them having appeased him as actually being spineless. And if they've appeased him here, they won't worry about it in the future. And so having taken over the Sudetenland in the, in the late, in October 1938, following spring in March, 
Mar the Germans then march into Prague and depose the Czechs, bloodless, completely bloodless invasion, depose the Czechs, take over the pink part, which is, becomes Bohemia and Moravia, and the Slovakian Republic is given independence, but is allied with Germany. And then a little piece is here to the east gets, gets carved off and given to Hungary here. And so Czechoslovakia disappears from the map. Had the Czechs fought in 1938, there's a very real possibility. In other words, had they not given up the state land, had they resisted, there's a very real possibility they would have won. Because 25% of the tanks that the Germans use in Poland, and then in the 1940 campaigns, not to mention artillery, not to mention machine guns and rifles, are Czech. So that's something that needs to be kept in mind. And that's and it's worth it's worth considering looking at Munich. When you look back on history, and even today the analogy is used, no more Munich. So let's not do another Munich. Let's not, which is a code word for appeasement, which is a code word for giving in to uh, aggression and, and authoritarian governments. This is why it is such a marker, is because in many ways this was the final great turn. Because it emboldened Hitler, not just with the Sudetenland, but then Czechoslovakia, and then to turn his attention to other areas that he looked to for expansion, as he put it, Lebensraum, living space for the Germans, but also to unite all Germans under, under great, the greater German Reich, under his rule from Berlin. So where are we? Having just discussed and thrown all that at you, let's look at where we are on the 31st of March, 1939, the day the Spanish Civil War ends. If you remember the map of 1914, you'll notice there was a very, fairly large empire in the central part of Europe, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Some of it has now become part of the German Empire, and all the red space that you see is now under Hitler's control. You'll notice two things. Number one, 31st of March is an important date in our story because of the end of the war in Spain, but especially because this is the day that Great Britain tells Poland we will guarantee your frontiers because they know Hitler has always had a sticking point about this area I'm circling with my cursor, the Polish corridor, which separates East Prussia, the province of East Prussia from the rest of Germany. And Hitler is already making noises about the oppressed, as he, as he terms it, oppressed Germans in this corridor and the German minority and is trying to play some of the same cards he played successfully with the Sudeten line last, the previous year. Now, why is this here? Okay, why is that there? This is a point that is often forgotten and is not understood and should be understood. I want you to look at these maps. These are two maps of Poland. The map here to the left is Poland in 1772 before and shows the three partitions, the first in 1772, and then the subsequent ones, the last one being 1795. Here is Germany, then Prussia. Down here is Austria, Hungary, Russia, over here. I want you to look at the right map. This is Poland, 1939. Here's the USSR to the east, Slovakia to the south, Germany, East Prussia, Lithuania. Now, the reason I put these up is because I want you to focus on the borders, particularly the, the northern, western, and the southern borders. You'll notice East Prussia in this map to the left looks a lot like East Prussia here to the, on the map to the right. As a matter of fact, parts of East Prussia in a plebiscite in the early 1920s had voted to stay German as opposed to going to Poland. And I'm circling that area with my cursor. You'll notice the po Polish borders to the west in 1772, they match the Polish borders of 1939. And the same with the borders here to the south. Borders to the east were determined in the Russo-Polish War settlement at the end of the Russo-Polish War in 1921. Why am I showing you this? because the northern, western, and southern borders of Poland were drawn in 1919 at Versailles. 
they drew Poland's 1772 frontiers. This corridor, which I'm circling here on the 1772 map, was there in 1772 and had been there for several centuries before. It did not exist, obviously it became German territory during the partitions and then from 1772 to 1919 was German and then it was recreated in 1919 and had existed for another 20 years. So when people look at a map of Poland 1939 and say, why is this Polish corridor here? Why, why were those people in Vienna or excuse me, in Versailles so stupid? They weren't. They were restoring Poland to its 1772 frontiers while also planting seeds for 1939. This is a very ethnic German part, this red area, this red province, I'm, and the green province right here were very much had a sizable German minority in both of them. And just like in the Sudetenland, Hitler is playing the same cards. He's pressuring Poland. He's pressuring Poland for guarantees of transit across here to give up some sovereignty in this area. The Poles, as far as they're concerned, are standing firm. They are not interested in, in compromise, particularly backed with the British guarantee. But before Hitler moves on Poland, he realizes he's got an issue to the east. Because if he moves on Poland, he's going to have to deal then with the Russians. He's going to have to do something about the Russians. And so he sends his foreign minister, which is the guy on the right, Ribbentrop, to sign a deal with Joseph Stalin, the non-aggression treaty of the 23rd of August, 1939. And it's not quite an alliance, but it certainly is, we're not gonna bother each other. You do what you have to do, I'll give you the freedom. Both sides say that. There are some secret protocols we'll talk about in a minute. Fortified with that, on the 1st of September, Hitler sends his forces into Poland. Just over a couple of weeks later, September 17th, 1939, the Soviets launch an offensive from the east. The Poles will hold out for six weeks particularly besieged Warsaw, which will surrender on the 28th of September. The last Polish forces will surrender down near Lublin, October 6th. Poland itself never surrendered. There are a lot of forces that will escape either to Lithuania or down to Romania and Hungary and will make their way to the West. And that will become the basis, of, for example, the Polish forces that fly with the RAF, Polish forces that serve in Britain. Um, Poland never surrendered and fought Germany until German surrender in 1945, in May of 1945. But this is the Polish campaign, and these two offensives basically crushed Poland from two separate directions. This is what first air raid on Warsaw does to the Royal Castle in downtown Warsaw. Um, again, another demonstration of attempted terror bombing. Doesn't terrorize the Warsaw population. What gives in ultimately is lack of food and water. Uh, but that's a whole other talk, perhaps, for a whole other time. We talked about German Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War, which which uh, just overran Poland in six weeks. Um, the next few months become what's called Sitzkrieg, Sitting War. Britain and France declare war on the 3rd of September. The French launch a very limited attack into the Rhineland. They move a few miles, occupy a few buildings or a few villages, turn back around, and settle back behind the Maginot Line. Immediately after the Soviets and the Germans meet in Poland, they partition Poland, the fourth partition. Poland again disappears on, off the map. She will reappear again in 1945 um, in Soviet and German spheres of influence. The war turns to the sea. The U-boats will start sinking uh, ships, British ships off of uh, the, off Britain. Um, they'll also sink the battleship Royal Oak in Scapa Flow in October 1939. The Russia, Russians and the Finns will fight a war 1939 to 1940. Um, some ways perhaps I've seen it analogized to what's going on in Ukraine today, but I'll leave that for you to study and uh, determine for yourself. Um, and then the Royal Navy will uh, force the Grafs Bay into Montevideo Harbor where she will scuttle herself on the 13th of December, 1939. So the Navy's at war, the Army's not really at war. The Air Force wants to bomb Germany. The RAF and the French Air Force want to bomb Germany. But particularly in Paris, the French government no, we are not doing this. We are not bombing factories. We're not bombing for fear of counterstrikes, for fear of what the retaliation may look like. We don't want a Guernica. We don't want Duhet, Duhet's to, uh, prophecies. We don't want to be the proof of that. We don't want to be a Warsaw. And so 
Germany has a fairly peaceful winter of 39-40. And then, of course, the peace, the Sitzkrieg, really ends with the Blitz on Norway and Denmark on the 9th of April, 1940, followed by the major offensive against France and the Low Countries beginning on the 10th of May, 1940, which, of course, will culminate in Dunkirk and then the armistice against Fran with France um, in June of 1940. Um, it should be pointed out that France lasted a little bit longer than Poland, but the Germans actually lost more casualties taking Poland than they did capturing France. And so that's how we get to war. That is the process of how we get from the Peace of Versailles in 1919, the 20 years of how we get from there to the invasion of Poland, and then from the invasion of Poland into the attacks of 1940, which will culminate obviously in Dunkirk, and then of course the fall with the Battle of Britain, fall of 1940. Before we conclude, I want to put some names to what we've been talking about. We've been talking about a lot of geopolitics, but this has personal effects and continues to affect people today. I dedicate this talk to my grandparents, Bolslav Kolokovsky and his wife, Georgina Ritzel. He was born in the United States, settled in Chichanov, Poland, north of Warsaw. He was in the Polish Army in 1939, was later in the Anders Army, 42 to 43. You can see Polish Air Force from 1943 to 47. When he met my wife in London, she worked as a telephone operator in the Admiralty and the British Admiralty for, during the war. They end up coming to the United States in 1947, not wanting to live under the communists. From 1939 to 1942, he spent it either internment in Lithuania or the vast majority of the time in a Soviet prisoner of war camp um, in, the, in the USSR. His parents, Josef and Mariana, are buried in Zhihanov today. Um, his older brother, Vladik, and his Romanian wife, Anna, also made it to New York, and their kid sister, Anna Kolokovska, was born legally blind and was swept up by the Germans and uh, executed as part of the Holocaust, considered an undesirable, um, undesirable handicapped person, to use the terminology that they used. And then the 21st Children of Warsaw Regiment is notable for two reasons. Number one, it was the, commanded by Stanislaw Sosobowski, who later commanded the Polish Brigade at Arnhem. For those of you who are familiar, Gene Hackman played him in the movie Bridge Too Far. But many of the dead of that regiment are buried in the same cemetery, just yards from where my great grandparents are buried. It's not too much to say that if the Germans had stopped at the Polish border on August 31st, 1939 and not invaded Poland, it's not too much to say that I would be giving you this address possibly in Polish. And so that, I leave you with that to ponder on, that this, despite having the impacts, we've been talking a lot of geopolitics, has definite personal impacts and affects the fates of millions and affects the fates of millions several generations in the future and so with that steve i'll throw it back to you i'd like to thank everybody for your attention i look forward to your questions and the discussion i'm going to stop sharing and steve back to you okay well uh thank you very much for uh sharing that that uh, presentation with us and it, it really goes to, to the point is that there, there isn't necessarily I mean, we, we point to September 1st 1939 as being the start of, of World War II but it's really something um, as we saw in the in your Pacific uh, road to war uh, presentation it's really something that 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 happens decades before and it's this the long festering sort of things that that have just happened along the way and, and you talked about the, the, the what if of uh, the Rhineland, and there are several others in there. But uh, before we get to those, uh, a couple of questions that came in. Um, the Versailles Settlement, uh, the, which basically disarmed, or was supposed to disarm Germany and set up the reparations, uh, there was no enforcement clause in, in that at all uh, to uh, to punish Germany for, for building up its, its arms in the, in the mid-30s? Actually, there was. There was an enforcement clause, and that's a great question. Um, there, there was actually two enforcement clauses. Um, the first one was, uh, we, we alluded, I alluded to it when I talked about the Rhineland and why the Rhineland is such a big deal, is if the Germans moved into the Rhineland without permission, the French had the right to go and forcibly evict them and send them back across the Rhine. So there was that enforcement mechanism, and that's why Hitler was so concerned. He said, if the French do something, turn right around. I don't want a general war. The French chose not to exercise that. There was also a clause in there permitting the British to land on the North Sea coast and advance inland with an expeditionary force if the Germans were violating the treaty as well. The British government never exercised that option either. So there were enforcement mechanisms 
but that's why I spent some time talking about kind of the national situations in these different countries for a variety of reasons. There wasn't the will, there wasn't the uh, wherewithal to exercise them when the time when the time was necessary. And that's an important point to to remember uh, World War One and the, the horrors of the war. And in previous wars had been maybe not as it, with World War One. You start getting into motion pictures, a lot more photography, a lot more of the the images of war have have come to more people. Uh, you have more widespread newspapers, things like that. And so, especially in Europe, there had to be this this feeling that we don't want to repeat this. And, you know, just looking at the the uh, political situation at the time and just saying, no, it's just just let Hitler take the Rhineland and maybe he'll be fine. And you know, as as we as we know now, that was just the, the first of many cards that would fall. Uh, that's that's absolutely right. Actually, a book that I would highly recommend if anybody wants to explore this is Alistair Horn's To Lose a Battle. Um, it focuses primarily on France and Germany, but it through through the lens of France and Germany, he spends time looking at some of these other nations. And it, it really explores that and how even even in the German military, we, t we tend to think have this impression that the German military shook off, took all the good lessons of World War One and then you know, move forward. It's not necessarily the case. And the shadows of World War One, particularly in the 1940 campaign, loom very, very large. Uh, the Germans, when the Germans went to war in 1939, you know, in contrast to 1914, where they were rioting in the streets in favor, in support of the Kaiser and going to war against, against France. In 1940, Berlin, or 1939, Berlin was, it was very somber. It was very somber. Even the Germans were not anxious for war in the way that uh, Hitler and his government was. So that's something, it, it's hard now looking back 80 years to sometimes capture the mentality of that decade, but we need to understand those mentalities to truly understand how we got to the September 1, 1939. Yeah. And uh, with Germany building up uh, Air Force uh, tanks, trucks, all that, Again, the, the the sort of maybe if we just let him let him let Germany do it, we're, they'll be fine. Uh, kind of attitude instead of stepping up and and trying to uh, you know in, enforce the uh, Versailles settlement. Uh, again, it's the appeasement rather than actual conflict. Exactly, exactly right. So we we mentioned um, the Rhineland as as being a, a, a what if. What are some of the other, in, in your research, what are some of the other what-if moments that may have changed the outcome uh, or the trajectory of, of this conflict? To me, there are two. I talked about the Rhineland, and I alluded to it, although I wasn't completely explicit about it. Munich, Munich to me, is the final turn. That's the great what-if, is what if, because the German army in 1938 was only 35 divisions. In 1939, it was 51 divisions, and when it mobilized, it doubled in size. The French and the British were much better off in terms of relative strength to the Germans, not to mention the fact the Czechs, and even the Poles probably would have gotten into it. Um, but certainly the Czechs, that's why I dwelt a little bit on the amount of Czech weaponry that in, the Germans ended up using and the border fortifications, if you really look at that um, and start playing out the hypotheticals, the Czechs had a legitimate chance to, at minimum, hold their own, if not win. And if that had happened, you know, you, who knows? You know, it, as long as Hitler was winning, he was gonna keep doubling down. But the moment he started losing, what does that do to the prestige of the regime? What does that do to inter the German internal situation? And what does that do to the to Europe? You know, does does Nazism get strangled right there? Um, you know, it's it it's an unanswerable question. Right. But to me, those are the two great what ifs: right. is Munich and then Rhineland, nineteen thirty six. You had uh, the slide with the uh, Nazi Soviet. Uh, non-aggression non pact. Um, but when the Germans attacked uh, Poland, then the Soviets did at this, or Russians did at the same time. What was the trigger for them to invade uh, at the same time? 
actually, they, I, I may have misspoke when I said that. The, the Soviets didn't invade at the same time. They actually let the Germans fight for 17 days. Okay. And then they went in. So the Germans go in September 1, the Russians go in September 17. And the reason that the, um, the, the, reason the Russians go in and, and wait that timing is, is really threefold. Number one, they let the Germans beat most of the Polish army. The Polish army had been had two defense plans, one against both the Germans and the Russians, and then they had one that could go either east or west. So in other words, fight one country, but the other one would be would be quiet. And so they deployed everything west against the Germans. And so the Russians kind of let the Germans beat most beat lots of the Polish army, although the, the Russians do have more fighting. It's not a, a cakewalk for them at all. The second reason that they delay is because they still got the issue over in the Far East with the Nomanan campaign, also known as Kalkan Gol, with the Japanese incursion into Siberia. Um, it's a border skirmish. The Japanese end up suffering very badly, but it's still going on in late August. It doesn't end until September 16th. And Stalin is not interested in a two front, quite frankly, a two front war. Um, and so that's why he delays. Um, and then the third reason the Russians go in is because the secret protocol is the fourth partition of Poland. The Germans have said, if you let give us Poland west of the Bug River, which is the modern, basically the modern border, eastern border of Poland, if you give us that, we'll get, you can have everything to the east. You can also take over the Baltic states at will if you give us a free hand in some of these other areas. And they basically divide up Eastern Europe into spheres of influence. That's a secret protocol. So the Russians already know the ter territory is coming. The Germans are beating the Poles to the west, and the Russians realize now's the time to move to assert control over our area before the facts on the ground change and are against us, as it were. And so that's why the Russians roll in when they do. Today, the Russians, I'll tell you, Vladimir Putin's regime has a very different interpretation of, those, of these facts than the one that I just presented to you. Um, they believe that they there's an interpretation that they were uh, re re rescuing uh, persecuted minorities by the uh, Poles. Um, and so the interpretation, even of the 1939 campaign, um, is still a geopolitical issue today. In fact, if you ask most Russians, World War II for them is 1941 to 45, when the Germans invaded. The 39 and 40 against the Finns are footnotes, if they even know about it. And what was it that, that caused Germany to begin moving again? Uh, we have the Blitzkrieg and then the Sitzkrieg, which goes on for, for quite a while. But what was the impetus for that to, to end and for them to continue? The short answer, weather. <laughs> Hitler actually wanted to attack the West as early as 19, November 1939. But the weather and logistics, because most of his army the vast majority of his army, as much as 75% or more, was in Poland, was committed to Poland. If the French had attacked in strength over the Rhine, they would have pushed, or into the Rhineland or over the Rhine, they would have pushed pretty far into Germany before the Germans could have stopped them. Um, you know, you'll never know how far. It takes time to then turn your army around and bring them back across and prepare for a major offensive. Um, not only into France, but also into Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Um, and so the logistics of that, November, they can't get it ready. Part of that's weather, because, I mean, let's be honest, the weather in Europe in November and December is, um, is not the best. Several times it's, it's postponed because of that. Um, and then in January, the plans fall into, but through accident, sheer accident, fall into the hands of the Allies. So then they have to pause and recast plans. Um, which becomes the famous sickle schnitt, the sickle cut that shit dashed to the channel through the Ardennes. Um, and then finally, finally they're able to go on May 10th. And so that's the, you know, that, that's why that's why you get this period of quiet, which the Allies are happy to have. The Allies are very happy to have it. They're they're not interested in provoke, provoking the Germans if they can avoid it. And again, thinking that if they can avoid confrontation, this may be all that, that Hitler will take. And, uh, and Exactly, yeah. exactly right. And it's still that palpable fear of what world, the ghosts of World War I, it's still that palpable fear of what state-on-state -state war looks like. 
You know, they can excuse Poland because it's far away. But when it's back on the same front door and on the same, potentially the same battlefields as World War I, there's a lot of, lot of concern about what that could be. On both sides, both Germany and France um, regarded the invasion in 1940 as perhaps 1914 redux. And there were a lot of people that thought it was going to end this, end up in a stalemate the same way it did in 1914. Obviously, it didn't, but there was a real fear and a real concern on both sides. Amazing. A very, as we said, a very complex uh, part of history. And, and uh, I guess that is uh, all of our history is complex. It's, you can't just take a, a moment in time and, and not realize where uh, where it actually came from and some of the some of the, the things that helped to influence uh, up to that point in time, no matter no matter what uh, point of history. And Chris, we are uh, just about out of time, but any uh, final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? Actually, I want to piggyback on what you just said, is that we should never forget. We A lot of times we tend to study history episodically, and I understand why that's done. I do that too sometimes. Um, but even if you look at an episode like this, The Road to War, you know, 1939, you know, Hitler's aggression, 38, 39, Never forget it's part of a continuum. And also never forget the human element in these stories. And, you know, things that may not be, through hindsight, may not be obvious or important to us, because we know how it turned out, to them was very important because they didn't know how it was going to turn out. And that's something that uh, should be borne in mind um, when you study this period or any period, is keep those Keep those thoughts in your mind. It'll help you understand and empathize more with uh, people in the, you know, in the in these situations. And one last question that just just popped in. Um, it, it says uh, briefly because this is a complicated one as well. Is how do the Russians go from being an ally of Germany to uh, part of the uh, uh, being an ally with the uh, United States and and uh, Britain? Actually, the short answer is the German invasion. Stalin didn't want war with Hitler until he was ready, until Stalin was ready. Hitler moved faster. And when it becomes at that point, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And um, that basically pushes Stalin into the Allied camp. And first the British provide Lend-Lease, and then of course the United States, after the United States enters the war in December 1941. So that's the short, short answer. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, again, don't forget to click that like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about any uh, future shows. As always, if you have ideas for uh, a topic you'd like to uh, you'd like us to uh, explore, please send Leah Block an email at media at cifhq.org. Again, thank you very much, Chris Kolakowski from the Veterans Museum in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, for sharing your insights uh, into the the complicated start to a World War II. And until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a great night.